Good afternoon, and welcome to today's special online event, How to Change the World. My name is Sam Smethers, Chief Executive of the Fawcett Society, the UK membership charity campaigning for gender equality and women's rights. And it's really exciting for me today to be hosting uh, the author of Difficult Women, A History of Feminism in 11 Fights. Uh, and I welcome her and all of you to this special recording hosted by the, e the RSA. Helen Lewis is a staff writer at The Atlantic and a former deputy editor of The New Statesman. She has written for The Guardian, The Sunday Times, New York Times and Vogue. She's also a regular host of BBC Radio 4's Week in Westminster and a frequent panellist on the News Quiz and Saturday Review. Difficult Women explores what today's campaigners can learn from the history of feminism, showing us how women activists from the past managed to build a supporter base that eventually won over the public, the courts and parliament, becoming one of the most successful social movements of our time. Helen, thank you for joining us. Hello. I'd like to start by asking you, what prompted you to write a book about the famous and the not so famous women of feminist history? Well, I'd been thinking about writing a book on feminism for about, well, a, a decade, really. I've been writing about the subject and I wanted to kind of collect everything down together and kind of exorcise it in some ways, you know, have my, um, my big statement on it. But quite soon I realised, you know, it's such an enormous subject. How on earth do you ever begin to do it justice? And you'd be always opening yourself up to the idea that you you know, you're biased from your own perspective, you're, you know, um, you're, you're not comprehensive in any way. And I thought, well, look, let's embrace that. And if I do it through the story of 11 fights, you know, particularly things like the vote and divorce, which, you know, some obvious, some not obvious, that will really help focus it for me. And also it will provide lively personal stories, right, which I think is what makes it come alive, is you actually really get the sense of the, the struggle uh, of these women to actually get stuff done. And for me, that's the deeper underlying theme of the book, particularly at a time when it can feel like things are very depressing. It's let's look at the fact that feminism got a lot of stuff done. How did it do that? You know, what compromises do you have to make? Who do you have to work with? You know, how do you deal with internal dissent? You know, when are you being autocratic and when are you just being a leader? All of those are really interesting questions for me about kind of power and how you use it. Yeah, brilliant. And it's really quite a, a messy history, isn't it? That really comes through the book. Um, and you start from a very personal perspective, which I have to say really drew me in from the beginning, um, because I've been through it too. Um, and that's the experience of divorce. So tell, tell us why you started there and, and, and how that felt. Well, for two reasons, really. One, in my own life, it was the kind of first time that I'd had a real experience of not exactly going off the rails, but certainly deviating from the script of what a kind of good girl looked like. You know, I was very lucky in my upbringing, came from a very happy home, did very well at school. You know, everything was just kind of proceeding along these very, uh, you know, neat tram lines. And then this was the thing that derailed all of that for me. And it was a big, big, you know, emotional event. And actually, the thing that was remarkable about it was, you know, legally, it was relatively simple and that is not something that the vast majority of women through history have been able to say because they haven't been able to own their own money in the first place and you know they haven't had the legal rights in order to have you know full status on, under the law so i thought well that's the perfect place to begin it because it speaks to both you know my personal thematic interest in it and also to this wider issue of what does feminism offer women well it offers women equality i mean that's you know, the kind of truncated version. But what that means for me particularly is about being an equal citizen under the law, you know, being able to have your economic independence and, and your legal independence. And the fight for divorce is where that all really kicks off. So you have the Married Women's Property Act in 1870, really important, but also these earlier things that... Um, Caroline Norton, who's the kind of heroine, if you want to call her that, at this first chapter of the book, fought for about custody of infants. Because, you know, it was assumed that, you know, children belonged to your husband. And actually, one of the things that she wrote about, which makes it quite a difficult heroine now, is that she thought that mothers of illegitimate children got treated better. You know, they had access. Whereas you, if you were married, you had, you know, you were kind of a chattel and your husband owned it, you know, owned you all kind of wholesale. Um, and you can see that legacy going all the way through now to the way that custody arrangement worked, you know, and the fact that the British courts now very strongly say that being a homemaker is just as important as being the breadwinner, which I think still people really still struggle with when a very rich man and uh, his wife, it's usually that way around, get divorced, you know, that she's entitled to half because they think, well, but that's his money. And you think, yeah, but you're <laughs> right. But this this family unit required a lot of work from both sides and two things. And actually we, we, the law says that those have to be valued equally. 
And it is all about value, isn't it? And that recognition, absolutely. Um, and we still see that playing out now in terms of inequality in the divorce system. Um, so thinking about um, the movement today and, and learning from those feminists of the past, what, what about the kind of compromises they had to make and the, um, you know, the, the conflict there was within the movement? You know, how, what can we learn from all of that in terms of what was effective? I'm really fascinated by that question because I had always, when we went through, I don't know, it's probably happened to you as well. When we went through 2018 and the anniversary, the 100 year anniversary of the women getting the vote, you couldn't move for people popping up to go, some, some women, some women, which is not an unfair point, but it was used to paint the suffragettes as these kind of middle class dilettantes who only cared about women like them. And they were undoubtedly primarily middle class. You know, the Pankhursts were pretty genteel as a family. But when you look into it, two things really struck me. The first is that they took that compromise and then 10 years later managed to get nearly very close to full um, female suffrage. And the second thing is that this happened, the, co- the speakers conference at which both Emmeline Pankhurst and Millicent Fawcett, so representing the militant and non-militant wings of that struggle, agreed to, you know, that it would be only women over 30 property owners. Uh, that happened in the context of the First World War in which huge, huge numbers of men were dying. And actually, if they'd given full suffrage, you know, they extended the franchise to men, to all men in 1918 and, and to some women. If they'd, let, you know, gone straight to full female suffrage in 1918, women would have outnumbered men uh, in, in, you know, as a part of the voting population. And that puts into context how radical a change this was for any government, you know, any set of politicians to agree to. Labour and the Liberals were both at different times very kind of queasy about women's suffrage because they thought women are going to vote Tory. They thought they were sort of innately conservative. And, you know, you know, we have these arguments now about we had a, a vote, um, you know, referendum on alternative voting. We talk all the time about should we have a list system? There are huge problems with first past the post uh, in terms of true representation. But it will always work best for the government that's currently in power, right? Because they got to power under the current system. And I think putting that in context really showed me that I think both Emmeline Pankhurst and Millicent Fawcett were right to take that compromise and see it as a staging post. It's a similar calculation made by Mary Stopes in the, in the sex chapter that she wanted to get contraceptive advice out to people, but she did that by saying, I have absolutely nothing to do with abortion. This isn't about abortion. I think, you know, that's horrendous and abhorrent. And you can see, you know, there were people at the time, such as Stella Brown, who really questioned that, that policy. But the idea was you did it gently and sympathetically and you didn't frighten too much off the, you know, the Church of England. And once you'd established the fundamental principle that women should be allowed to control their fertility, that was a thing that you had a, a right to do, then actually the next step became easier. And I think I feel the same really pretty much about um, civil partnerships leading to gay marriage. It was a way to get over the objections of the established churches. And once you got there, people kind of thought, well, it's not such a big deal to just change the, the name of it and how we think about it. Um, you know, so I think all of those situations, those people got attacked at the time for, for compromising and history is very kind to them. It might not always be the right thing to do, but it was, it was very interesting to me that those did all seem to be borne out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, there are many examples now where you can see that actually winning the principle and getting your foot in the door first is actually the essential battle and the, the victory to have before you move mm. to the, the final sort of ultimate victory. Um, the book is, is written in, in particular sort of themes in each chapter, so I just wanted to explore a couple of those with you now. The first being time, because mm. um, this is a very live issue uh, at the moment with the schools closing and uh, the question of who's going to take the full brunt of that, who's going to do the caring at home now, and we know that many, many women are going to be really struggling as a result of this. So... Um, you know, you talk about in the book about unpaid caring work being a real constraint on women's activism. Uh, you know, ultimately, how can women go out there and fight for their rights when they're busy at home, just keeping the household going? So just tell us a bit more about that in terms of how you explore that question of what we value. Yeah, I think it's something that affects every social justice movement. You know, the civil rights movement was hampered by tropes about how African-Americans were too kind of angry um, and, and they had to renegotiate that. And, you know, anti-poverty movements have to deal with the fact that you don't have a lot of free time in order to do campaigning when you're just you know, trying to keep a roof over your head. Movements for the, the disabled, similarly. And feminism hasn't been 
exempt for that. There's this bit I quote in the book, you know, the famous apocryph, you know, tr- attributed to George Orwell, like everything is, you know, the problem with socialism is it takes up too many evenings. You know, and the problem with feminism is you're trying to do it while cleaning the oven and changing a nappy. And I think that's really true. And, and, and coronavirus, I've just written a piece for the Atlantic about this, you know, it will have gendered impact. We know from previous epidemics of Ebola, of Zika, of SARS, that actually what happens in these situations is that women's livelihoods get hit harder and take longer to bounce back. And you see, um, you know, on lockdowns, an increase in domestic violence, for example, because people are in the home, and for some people, the home is not a safe place to be. Um, In Ebola, it was very obvious from people I talked to that maternal mortality, which is already a huge problem in Sierra Leone, one of the countries affected by it, that went up during the crisis because everything in the health service was devoted away from it. Um, you know, these are big underlying problems. And, and lots of the problems that I talk about in the book do relate to, to time fundamentally and, and, and time being a metaphor for, for money, if you see what I mean. Um, your ability to earn, your kind of, you know, your ability to move through the economy and, and maximise your earning capacity. Um, so I thought that was one that was a it was a chapter that I wrote very late in the process. I kind of carved it out from a, a wider leisure chapter, and that went to play, which is about women's sport primarily, and then a separate chapter on time. And I'm really glad that I did that because it is the issue that, to my mind, underlies all the other issues. It's often invisible, isn't it? Yeah, this mm. the, the the way that sort of time and and unpaid care work burden sort of falls on women and makes it um, particularly invisible. So I was really pleased that you'd included it explicitly as a chapter in the book. I was really surprised when I looked at the statistics from my Atlantic piece, but I already knew that 68% of carers allowance, so that's people working 35 hours a week uh, or more as a carer for someone else, is is claimed by women. So that's 800,000 people are entitled to, 800,000 women are entitled to at 1.3 million. Um, you know, and, and in terms of part-time working, only 13% of men in employment work part-time, um, 40% of women. So what happens is that that ends up, you know, you don't just pick up the slack maybe from the kids, you pick up the slack from the elderly parents who need a parcel taking around to them or, you know, what it is. And, and I think there's also an interesting kind of generational thing. Someone said to me about, you know, that this crisis will reveal the amount of unpaid work that's done by 50, 60, 70 year old women for their parents who are, who are still alive. And I think that's, you know, that's very true as well. Um, and, and women do more volunteering. It's, that's a, it's a smaller um, gender disparity. But they're definitely, all of those effects are, are there. Women are kind of expected to be selfless. And that manifests in different times at, in, during different parts of their lives. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that takes us to this sort of chapter about work, because this exploring what, you know, both paid and unpaid work and the fact that, um, you know, it, it's not only about how much time we take and spend on work, but also who and what we value. And in the in the book, you explore the Grumwick strike in particular um, and the significance of that event and Jay Ben Desai. And so I just wondered if you could just tell us a little bit more about why you chose that event in history to, to focus on. I think the 70s is a period that I didn't know an enormous amount about. So I was just really interested because they are such a fertile time for feminism. You get, um, you know, from the Equal Pay Act in 1970 and the Sex Discrimination Act in 75, two huge pieces of, of equalities legislation. So I was already interested in, in that. And then you get the end of the decade, 79, Britain gets its first female prime minister, but she's a conservative and she's not a self-identified feminist by any means. So that's an interesting thing to deal with too. And Jeb and Desai was incredibly interesting to me because she smashed stereotypes of what a woman could be in this particularly racialized way, in a way I think that's still really resonant now. So the Gramwick factory, you know, deliberately employed South Asian immigrants, and she was originally from Gujarat via Tanzania to, to North London. You know, thinking that this was a migrant workforce, primarily women, they would be kind of grateful to be in work. They didn't really need the money. They were only kind of, you know, it was pin money or whatever, or students, um, and that they would be kind of uncomplaining um, and passive. And that's something that, you know, I think is a, is a really a, a particularly kind of racial expectation that's put on South Asian women. And, and she wasn't at all. She was a total firebrand, an incredibly um, impressive speaker. She understood the power of her image incredibly well. So, you know, just as the suffragettes knew that purple, white and green were these incredible, you know, it was, it was, they had a livery and a colour scheme and they gave out hunger strike medals and they all wore white to Emily Davison's funeral, creating this kind of huge sea. 
um, of, of, of you know lack of colour. Um, so Jab and Desai, you know, and her fellow strikers knew that they, you know, they were the strikers in saris. They knew they looked different to what people expected a trade unionist to look like. You know, people were kind of expecting a kind of red-faced man in his fifties, and they didn't look like that. And when she spoke, people weren't used to hearing a, a South Asian woman speak like that. And that's one of the things I, I really like. And I talk about it in the sport chapter as well, about the England netball team going up and receiving their award for you know um, team of the year. And these incredibly tall, strong women in ball gowns, you know, being rewarded for being world champion athletes. It's just, to me, it expanded slightly my idea of, of what, how I think about women. And I feel very strongly that, that, that Jai Bin Desai did that too. Yeah, and I think she was challenging in many directions, wasn't she? She was challenging the trade union movement. Yeah. She was challenging her employer. She was challenging society. And it, on all fronts, she was taking people on. Yeah, she's a massively inspirational figure, I think. Um, and then thinking about the chapter on education, which uh, also features another one of my favourite women of history, Sophia Jex Blake. Mm. Um, and, you know, that, that battle in, in the 19th century for access to higher education and in particular, she's one of the Edinburgh Seven who fought to qualify as a doctor. So you know, she had to really uh, open up that uh, profession to women. So tell us about why you chose her and why her fight was so important. Sophia Jake Blake really illustrates one of the things that I thought very strongly when reading the book, which is write it down, be the person who writes it down. And, you know, it's, it's notable to me, I kind of only realised at the end, I am so biased towards people who left behind large amounts of correspondence in the case of the suffragettes or memoirs. Again, um, you know, Jeb and Desai luckily spoke extensively at the Scarman inquiry into that strike. So we have lots of her words on record. You know, making sure that you leave permanent records behind. And with Sophia Jex Blake, there is a, a you know book by her about this precisely the dispute. Um, so we kind of remember her over and above the other six women. But you know they they did something extraordinary, which is um, that uh, Emily uh, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. I get my Garretts mixed up. The sister of Millicent Garrett Fawcett. She had managed to get round the ban on um, women training in medicine, but through a loophole. Right? She she took a, a qualification with a livery company, the Society of Apothecaries. And as soon as they spotted that someone had done that, they kind of went clamped down on that. So Sophia Jexbate decided that the only way she was going to be able to train as a doctor was that she was going to have to convince a full-scale university to take her on. And she thought Edinburgh, you know, the Scottish Enlightenment had happened. It was seen as being quite a progressive place. She thought that would be the place to try. And she said all she was asking for was a fair field and no favour, which I think is a really great kind of feminist slogan. Um, but, but the interesting thing about that is the resistance that they face, which is something that Elizabeth Garrett Anderson did as well, because they did too well. And there was one of the women came third in one of the sets of exams, and that should have entitled her to a prize, to a scholarship. Uh, and no, of course, she wasn't given that. It was given to the, the man next down who did worse than her. But all the way through, you could see this resentment was kind of building. And people would throw stuff at them and screech and shout. She says, you know, shout anatomical words at them, which, of course, being medical students, we, we perfectly understood. And it culminated in this, the Surgeon's Hall riot of uh, 18th of November, 1870, uh, in which, you know, the, a live sheep was shoved into their, um, their classroom. You know, these, and a kind of whole group of rowdies, as she describes them, are, are milling around outside. You know, these were women who were genuinely in fear of their safety. And it kind of reminded me of... Um, you know, the American South in the 40s and 50s desegregating its school system. And we've got photos of that. And you can see the rage on people's faces as they're screaming at these tiny African-American kids who would just want to go to school. And you can see how profoundly challenging it is to people when education is desegregated, because it is its power. You know, I think of Malala Yousafzai, you know, shot in the head for advocating for girls education in um, Pakistan it is it people know that if you're educated it's it's a passport to a different kind of life it's why people so, you know so much want their kids to be educated but it's so destabilizing and limiting knowledge to a certain class of people is such a way to keep hold of your power yeah absolutely and most people don't realize just how late it was that women were actually allowed to even get degrees in this country mm -hmm. In Cambridge, it was 1948 before women could actually be awarded a degree. I mean, that's just incredible, really, isn't it? Um, and so Even now in, in China, so women are banned from taking um, certain subjects, so like mining, for example, because the theory is they wouldn't be able to run out of a, a mine fast enough. And I found that, you know, it, within the last 
two, three years, Tokyo University Medical School in Japan was secretly down marking female applicants' papers um, because it didn't want too many women working in its medical workforce because it thought, well, they'll all leave, they'll go and have, they'll go and have children. And you know, the one answer to that is institute much more family-friendly working hours. You know, the majority of the medical workforce in Britain is um, is female. You know, most GPs are coming through and training now. Most medical students are female. You know, it, it is there are ways to to deal with it apart from secretly telling women that they're rubbish, <laughs> right? And to keep deliberately exclude them from the workforce. That's the kind of old-fashioned, straight up and down sex discrimination that. I think people would be surprised to know still exists, right? It's often much softer forms of discrimination now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you a bit more about why some women made the cut in this book and some women didn't, because you've, you've gone for 11 fights and you featured, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously amazing women. I'm not objecting to any of the ones you've included, but just, you know, who didn't make the cut and why? Well, um, I started writing this in 2017, the end of it, and that was before Sally Wainwright's Gentleman Jack had come out. And actually, Anne Lister was one of my early choices. I studied her at university, and those diaries are incredible. She's living this, you know, very openly lesbian life and very openly gender non-conforming life. And that's why she was called, nicknamed Gentleman Jack. Um, and I thought that was quite extraordinary. But the more I read about her, the more I thought there's a real difference between somebody who is just trying to campaign to live their own life the way they want and somebody who is actually trying to affect broader social change. You know, um, Anne Lister is sort of fundamentally conservative with a, with a small C. She's not a radical, uh, except for, you know, that she wants to, to, to do, you know, marry who she wants and live her the way that she wants. So I thought actually Maureen Cahoon, who I ended up writing about is a more interesting example of that. And um, Babs Todd and Jackie Forster who founded Sappho, the, this trailblazing magazine for, for lesbians in the 70s, because, you know, they were all pushing, they were you know, they wanted it for everybody. Um, there's a great quote from, from Babs when she says, you know, we, Jackie and she said, you know, we swore as long as we lived that we wouldn't let anyone else go through this shit. You know, they, they had such difficulties when they, when they came out, you know, they felt, they felt such a, a lack of community. Um, that they just wanted they wanted to make life better for other women and since publishing the book i've i've heard from a couple of women who you knew them you know now in their uh you know late 80s one of them um you know that who had been married and only sort of found this word lesbian or this idea lesbian you know quite late in life and and that changed everything for them um and those stories i think now again when gay rights are such a mainstream issue and you kind of you know every bank has got its own pride float it, it's hard to recapture exactly how hard and how isolated um you know and how discriminated against it was to be a, a gay or lesbian in the in the 70s and before and also you know thinking internationally there are many countries where you know, gay women and men are still persecuted and outlawed yeah. and so you know there's very much a, a, an issue that's still yet to be progressed in many, many other societies. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions, so I'm going to add another one, uh, going off script a bit. Um, just to go on the, on, onto the chapter on abortion, um, yeah. I just wanted to just get your comments and reflections in particular on the recent progress in New Zealand on decriminalisation um, and to see, you know, it, it's one of those other sort of fundamental fights, isn't it, the sort of control over women's bodies and who has control, you know, ultimately. And we've, we've seen some progress recently in Northern Ireland, seen obviously the progress in the Republic of Ireland, but it felt like almost like that would never change. And all of a sudden there has been that shift. And just, can I just get your reflections on that in terms of why it's happened now? What, what's been the thing that's tipped it into progress after all these years when it's felt like it was an almost untouchable issue? That's a really interesting question. I think that um, actually the move from collectivism to individualism as, as a society, which I think has been happening since the seventies, you know, it's pretty well documented and it's had lots of um, negative effects for, for feminism. You know, there's more of an expectation if you have children, that's your choice in some way, you know, and therefore every, everything that flows from it, you know, you have to take it on the chin rather than the idea of children as a kind of collective, you know, social good or a, a kind of collective project that, you know, or even economically the idea we want people to pay into our pensions um, so it's definitely had some some complicated effects for feminism, but one of the upsides of it, I think that the argument about bodily autonomy has become a lot more salient to most people. The argument that the government or religious authorities don't have the right to forcibly keep you pregnant 
um, has become much more intuitively appealing to people in the in the West, particularly. That's what I felt you saw in Ireland. I thought, well, maybe this will be a kind of, you know, there will be an anti-establishment mood here because both the main parties are, you know, support the repeal the eighth and and the kind of liberal elite, whatever you want to call them, do as well. But the, the, uh, the counterpoint to that is that to some extent, the church is still seen as the establishment. You know, people have still have memories of, uh, you know, past cases of there was a girl who died on a hillside, for example, having just given birth to a, to a baby, you know, in, in rural Ireland, not too many decades ago. And that really played into it. So that sense of sort of freedom and liberation for you personally, I think, has become an, an, an easier argument to make. That said, I have been thinking about this recently, and I am kind of wary about the move to, you know, in Britain asking for abortion on demand. You know, currently we have this fig leaf of two doctors who have to sign it off. And I do worry in light of everything we've seen around Brexit or around um, gender issues, that this will become a, a kind of culture war. Uh, and, and actually it will become a site for kind of reactionaries to try and push back on the rights that we already have. And I wonder whether or not it is one of those things that is is best left. But that... That also feels wrong to me that that's a kind of council of despair that you should spend all your time, you know, guarding the castle that you've got rather than trying to look outwards. And certainly going back to reading stuff from the 1970s, it was striking to me how much more utopian it was, how much more people felt they were on a trajectory of, of progress that, that we have lost. And you do need a bit of that kind of things can get better, the kind of hopefulness, right, in order to do any kind of social movement or social change. I think that's right. And it was a bit of a, a dilemma, I know, around the 50th anniversary of the Abortion Act, for example, when um, it was this debate, should it, should it be a, a campaign to push forwards or should it be a, almost like a, a defensive line? Mm. Um, and I suppose my argument is, you know, advancing things, you know, uh, attack is the best form of defence, really. So trying to push it forwards and, and, and having that discussion about body autonomy is better than, than staying in a bunker and being a bit defensive. Um, but I think it's always a risk. I think that's absolutely right. Um, before I come to the last question, I also just wanted to pick up on your Atlantic piece. So I think that, that was really fascinating on the current crisis that we're in and the impact that's having on women and it's, the impact it's having on feminism. And it, it, so the headline anyway is a bit negative, it's a bit bleak. Um, so tell us a bit about really what you're thinking and, and do you see if there's any positives? Do you think there's a chance that actually this might be a positive turning point for women or we could make it into a positive or is it, Actually, it's trying to send us all back to the 1950s. Well, my, yeah, so my working headline on it was, you know, that coronavirus is a disaster for feminism. Um, and you get all these people going, well, the thing is, you know, William Shakespeare wrote King Lear during the plague. And you're kind of like, well, his wife and two adult daughters were in, in Stratford and he was in London. You know, um, Isaac Newton did, it's true, get a lot done, but he, you know, he never married or had children. And there's a brilliant book by Katrina Marcel called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? that is exactly along these lines. You know, the fact that Adam Smith was sitting there writing his theory about capitalism while his mum made him tea is, you know, is, is, is a kind of deeply important fact that we need to, we need to recognise. And so my worry is that, you know, when you know, women are primarily in straight relationships, the lower earner, uh, or the more likely to be in part-time work, then it makes sense if one of you has to take a career hit that it'll be, you know, it'll be the woman. Um, you know, I think single parents will be particularly badly hit by the school closures, and the majority, the vast majority of them are, are women. So that's what really worries me about it, aside from all the other stuff swelling around about, particularly about violence, um, is that it would just fundamentally drive a lot of people back into quote unquote traditional gender roles rather than you know, externalizing their childcare. That's been the way that we've, we've sort of sorted this problem for professional dual earner couples. Uh, you know, but equally well though, I do think that it has already and will already change the conversation about um, about how much state intervention we can kind of reasonably expect. You know, it's like the financial crisis of 2007 on, on steroids, really, because already you've got businesses, you know, very happy to take vast private profits coming to the treasury for a handout and a bailout. Um, you know, when I think about the airline industry, Tim Wu wrote a brilliant piece in the New York Times about this, you know, saying we have to acknowledge that this isn't just a private industry. It's actually critical infrastructure. Um, and therefore, we should take that into account when, you know, when and if we bail out the airline industry about what they, you know, what, what can we expect from them in return as a kind of pub, pu public service. And I think childcare and elderly care are also critical infrastructure, too. And that's one of the ways that we should talk about them. They are the thing that makes every other bit of the economy run and, and work. 
Um, and we've just been very laissez-faire, I think, in the last couple of decades about letting private companies externalize you know, so many of the effects that they have, whether that's pollution into the atmosphere, you know, not fully paying for their, their effect and, and not fully paying for the fact that they have, you know, workers who turn up every day. That means that someone else is having to, you know, look after their dependents. And actually, you know, I, it's one of the things that makes me sound most Bernie Sanders like, there's not many things that make me sound like Bernie Sanders, but this is kind of one of them, is the way that we have let companies, private industry, flatter itself enormously about how efficient it is that relies on a lot of people doing unpaid unpaid work and relies on a lot of negative externalities in you know, in terms of the environment and i would hope that we could kind of have a bit of an accounting of of that you know this is a chance to change that conversation my worry about it is always there is the kind of wartime not now dear um, which you get a lot when you try and raise feminism in the context of any kind of big crisis, as if it's a kind of nice add-on. Like, once we've got everything else sorted, then we'll have a little sit-down and chat about nursery provision. And it's not. It's, it's, it's absolutely critical. Fundamentally, if, you know, if key workers in the NHS can't get into the NHS, more people will die. So this is a, this is a pandemic critical you know, issue apart from anything else. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. We've got to make we've got to make women visible, haven't we, in this whole crisis? And at the moment, you know, all the men in the treasury and the men sort of uh, in those number ten briefings uh, are just not seeing women and focusing on women. So that's got to be part of it, including who we even define as a key worker. You know, like domestic violence shelters, etc., are key infrastructure services, but they're not scoped in to that definition at the minute. So that's going to be a core focus for us going forward, absolutely. Um, just, to, just to finish, I wanted to ask you kind of the obvious question, I suppose, but I'm bound to ask it. Um, do you describe yourself as a difficult woman and when did you first work out that you were one? I'm trying to be a more difficult woman. I don't think I'm difficult enough. I think I'm too much... This will probably surprise people who um, see me on Twitter, but I think of myself a bit too much. I'm a bit of a people pleaser. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons... I was thinking about this... Um, in regards, there was a, a terrible coronavirus meme that was about, you know, people are panic buying, but, you know, they you know can't get enough groceries because Karen and Susan have stripped the shelves. And it's this very particular kind of sexism that's directed at kind of middle aged women in particular. Um, and I've seen it a lot as well in contemporary feminist debates, this idea that older women are kind of cronish and out of touch and, and boring in this very fundamental way that like, you know, um, you know, I, I just think that's that is about the fact that actually those are the kind of women presumably who are likely to take less, you know, give zero, whatever you might want to call them. But, um, but I think there is a, you know, there is a thing that women get more difficult as they age by and large. They care less about what people think about them um, and, and get more willing to kind of demand, you know, make their own demands need. And, uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that makes older women kind of slightly dangerous. So I am looking forward to a, hopefully um, a long life of getting progressively more difficult. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. I certainly feel more difficult than I was 10 years ago, and I'm going to be so awful when I'm 80. <laughs> I'm determined to be. But Helen, thank you very, very much indeed for that. It was a fascinating uh, interview. I really recommend to everyone, please buy the book. I've got my copy. I can wave it at you now. There you go. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, it's absolutely fascinating, full of great individual stories and uh, fantastic insight. Um, do stay tuned to the RSA's channels for all the latest information on upcoming events and for access to a vast archive of world-changing content. And thank you to everyone for watching. Stay well and stay safe.